Thank you, colleagues. We'll now move on to portfolio questions on economy, jobs and fair work. And we... are about to start, but... Question number one is going to be Ivan McKee. If, if Mr McKee is ready. Question number one, Ivan McKee. Uh, thank you, um, presiding officer. Um, can I uh, ask the Scottish Government what assessment is made of the risk to Scotland's economy of businesses leaving the country? Uh, there is no access to the EU single market and a so-called hard Brexit strategy is pursued by the UK Government. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. Uh, there are around 1,000 EU-owned companies in Scotland employing over 127,000 people. That membership of the single market is vital in securing such investment and according to the EY Attractiveness Survey, 79% of inward investors into the UK list access to the EU single market as an important factor in their investment decision. A hard Brexit will reduce the openness of the economy and have a detrimental effect on Scotland's attractiveness as a location for inward investment. Ivan McKee. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that in my role as Parliamentary Liaison Officer for the Economy, I take a, take a keen interest in the economic impact of Brexit. It's generally accepted that a hard Brexit, with the UK leaving the EU single market, will act as an incentive to many businesses currently based in the UK that trade across the EU to move their operations to a location within the single market. What is the Scottish Government doing to encourage those businesses to locate here rather than in another EU country? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the latest figures, as I've mentioned, from the EY Attractiveness Survey confirm that 2016 was a record-breaking year for foreign direct investment into Scotland, and it's against that background we have to judge these issues. We have already proposed a way in which Scotland could stay in the single market, even if it was the case that the UK came out of the EU, but this has been rejected out of hand by the UK Government. One worrying are some suggestions recently that the UK government is actually scenario planning for no deal uh, at all, which would be disastrous both for the UK and Scottish economy. But the Scottish government will continue to do all that it can to protect Scotland's interests in Europe during the forthcoming negotiations and, of course, to promote Scotland as a destination of choice, despite the damage being done by the UK government. Murdo Fraser. What assessment has the Scottish Government made of the risks to Scotland's economy of businesses leaving the country if a hard border is created between Scotland and our biggest market elsewhere in the United Kingdom? That hard border being, according to the Scottish Government's own experts, a consequence of pursuing a differentiated deal with the EU from that applying elsewhere in the United Kingdom? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we have no proposals for a hard border to exist and see no reason for a hard border to exist between Scotland and the rest of the UK. And it surprises me that a Conservative Party which proclaims to be in favour of business would want to talk up the prospects yeah. of a hard border uh, uh, between Scotland and England. We have no suggestion for that. But once again, what we have is no uh, reference at all uh, in terms of this uh, economy, in terms of questions or debates from the Conservatives about the fact that we've just seen the UK trade deficit increase by nearly double from £2.6 billion pounds to £4.9 billion. Pounds. Inflation now at 2.7%, borrowing today up to a three-year high. National debt of £1.8 trillion. Pounds. That's the record of the Conservative Party in government. Why don't you talk a bit more about that in terms of damaging Scotland's interests? John Mason. Uh, th thank you, Presiding Officer. At the Economy Committee, we took quite a lot of evidence uh, about Brexit and the number of Scottish companies that are very dependent on uh, workers from the European Union coming here. And these included uh, Angus Soft Fruits, fish processing sector, uh, and Walker's Shortbread. Does he think the UK government understands how much our food and drink sector need these kind of workers? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, if they do understand, they're uh, showing no signs of understanding that. John Mason is absolutely right about the critical nature of EU nationals, not least in the sectors which he mentioned. Uh, hospitality is one that's very obvious, uh, but the soft fruit sector as well, and in terms of financial services. And perhaps it's the most frequent uh, issue that's raised with me by businesses across Scotland. The threat to having uh, internationally mobile people that can come to Scotland and help improve our economy. It is a real threat, one not acknowledged nearly sufficiently by the UK government, one threat threatened by the idea of a hard Brexit and, of course, even more threatened by the idea of no deal at all. So we will continue to provide what reassurance we can to uh, nationals. I'm aware 
from uh, higher education institutes and others that people are leaving already. People are leaving the economy that we would want to stay in this economy. That can't be good for Scotland. And I would urge for one last time the UK government to make clear that EU uh, nationals in the UK will have the right to stay uh, as they should have been given that uh, assurance immediately after the Brexit referendum. Dean Lockhart. Uh, th thank you. The Cabinet Secretary quite rightly highlights the importance of jobs for the Scottish economy. Has he had the opportunity to read the most recent Fraser Vanda report that confirms that over 500,000 jobs in Scotland relies on the integrity of the UK single market? Cabinet Secretary. I think my previous response to arguing against what the Tories are wanting to talk up in terms of a hard border recognises, of course, uh, the importance of the UK market to Scotland and the Scottish market to the UK. I do recognise those things. But I was interested to read the jobs figures, which showed a 42-year low for unemployment in the UK, which is great. But Scotland's unemployment was even lower. Not one word of congratulation from the Conservatives, not one mention of it, just as there's been no mention of the EY attractiveness survey and 122 new projects coming to Scotland. It seems the last things the Tories would ever want to do is talk up the positive elements of the Scottish economy. Jackie Bailey. Um, let me welcome the EY survey because I do think it makes interesting reading but would the minister perhaps concede that the percentage growth is down substantially on the last year and in terms of jobs foreign direct, direct investment has accounted for even fewer jobs than were accounted for last year and I wonder if he has an explanation for that. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, it's a fair point, and I, I would say that part of the explanation, at least perhaps a large part of the explanation, lies in the fact that around 35% uh, of those foreign direct investments uh, are with employers who do not want to uh, release the details of the employment uh, consequences for that. Well, it's stated actually in the report, if you would read the report, that's what it says. So it's not possible for us to itemise that. But I do also take some substantial encouragement, both from the fact there's no percentage decrease in the number of uh, uh, projects coming to Scotland. In fact, it's gone up from 119 to 122, and of course places that second only behind uh, the southeast of England. But it's also true to say we've seen an increase in research uh, projects coming, research and development. That's absolutely crucial. And again, what stakeholders say to me is they want foreign direct investment, but they want to see more research coming to Scotland. And that's got to be a promising prospect given these latest figures. Question number two, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it supports women into work. Jamie, Minister Jamie Hepburn. The Scottish Government is taking a number of steps to not only support women into employment, but also to reduce gender inequality in the labour market, to tackle discrimination and to improve women's position in the workplace. I recently announced funding of up to £200,000 to deliver a programme of support to women who wish to return to work after a career break, building on the £50,000 funding I previously announced for Kuwait Scotland to undertake a similar programme specific to the STEM sector, also chairing a working group to look at pregnancy and maternity discrimination in the workplace, we announced funding of up to £500,000 for a workplace equality fund to address long-standing barriers in excess in the labour market. We're establishing an advisory council of women and girls to inform our action to tackle gender inequality. On top of funding, we're taking action through the Women and Enterprise Action Framework to tackle the gender gap within enterprise growth. The government continues to promote flexible working and have provided £178,700 for 2016-17 to the Family Friendly Working Scotland Partnership to support and promote the development of family friendly workplaces across Scotland. Claudia Beamish. Thank the Minister for that answer, but this problem is indeed very intractable and the paid labour market in Scotland is fundamentally skewed away from women. Women, as the Minister and those in this chamber know, make up the majority of some of the, small, of, of the lowest paid sectors, care, hospitality, retail for example, and even full-time employment can leave women struggling to pay rent, feed their families and without financial independence vital if they have to leave their home, for instance, um, because the situation is unsafe due to domestic violence. Does the Minister agree with me that support for Labour's pledge to a £10 living wage by 2020 would certainly be a step towards correcting this deplorable situation? And what action specifically is the Government taking to address women's low pay? Minister. Well, of course, what we're doing is we're delivering a range of uh, funding to uh, the Poverty Alliance to take forward the Living Wage Accreditation Scheme. Uh, I've been able to meet with the Living Wage Foundation. They say they are very uh, pleased with the work we're seeing uh, here uh, in Scotland. We now have over uh, 800 uh, accredited uh, employers. We also lead by example, ensuring those covered by our pay policy are paid at least uh, the living wage. And that's very important, of course, because we know, as uh, members rightly said, that uh, those who 
are in low pay are predominantly women. So we know that that policy is making a difference. And we also, through a range of activity I've set out in conjunction with the Scottish Funding Council, SDS are taking every effort, and indeed through uh, the uh, Development Young Workforce Programme, taking every effort to address some of the structural and attitudinal barriers that exist to uh, ensure women are better represented across the entire gamut of the workforce. Ruth McGuire. Thank you. Can the Minister provide detail on how female employment in Scotland compares to female employment across the UK as a whole? Minister. Uh, well, I certainly can say that uh, we've seen the situation improving over uh, the last year. We uh, have seen uh, the latest available data shows that female part-time working has decreased over the year by uh, 13,000, uh, while female full-time working has increased uh, by 32,000. Uh, and, of course, that has led to a situation where we have an employment rate for uh, women. The latest uh, statistics show an employment rate of 78.8%, uh, an employment rate of 4.2%. Uh, both of these measures were doing better in the UK as a whole. Gordon Lindhurst. <coughs> Does the uh, Minister believe that the loss of 152,000 college places, uh, many of which are for part-time courses, has a detrimental impact on supporting women into work, in particular those returning to the workplace after a break? Minister. Well, what I can uh, say to Mr Lindhurst, and I know he takes an interest in these matters as the, the convener of the Economy uh, Committee, is that uh, Scotland's colleges are doing uh, a lot of work to help women into employment. They'll be taking that further through uh, their uh, uh, action plan for uh, gender equality. But we know the number of women in full-time courses is up by over 12% since 2006-07. Women account for the majority of college enrolments, 51% uh, in 2015-16. Uh, and indeed, uh, there is uh, still significant part-time opportunities available at, uh, at colleges in Scotland. The majority of total enrolments at college are still in part-time FE uh, courses. The latest figures show uh, almost uh, two-thirds of uh, courses being uh, the case. So our college sector is playing a significant uh, role in improving the prospects of uh, women and indeed the entire population of Scotland. Question three, Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it's taking to deliver inclusive growth for Orkney. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, we're committed to supporting inclusive and sustainable growth across Scotland, including in Orkney. We're investing in businesses, communities and infrastructure across the islands. For example, we're investing in a new hospital and healthcare facilities project and EV primary school, which opened last November. We're providing £0.5 million to Orkney Island Council through the Regeneration Capital Grant Fund for the Orkney Research Campus project in Stromness, which will support over 100 jobs. Highlands and Isles Enterprise continues to work closely with ambitious businesses and communities to support growth and boost employment. And furthermore, the Scottish Government continues to press UK ministers for appropriate support to both ensure grid connections to the mainland and support for island wind projects, both of which will significantly enhance the economic and social development prospects uh, for the Orkney Islands and thereby support inclusive growth. Liam MacArthur. Can I thank the Minister uh, for that, uh, that answer and, and much of it I very much welcome. Of course, part of uh, inclusive growth is about helping different uh, communities overcome specific challenges they face in order to be able to play to their strengths. For my constituents, that is about allowing key sectors of the local uh, uh, economy to compete on a level playing field. Unfortunately, the cost of lifeline ferry services continue to put our islands at a competitive dis disadvantage. Nine years after cheaper ferry fares were first introduced on West Coast routes, a year after the First Minister's commitment to, and I quote, begin work immediately to cut the cost of ferry fares for those living, working and visiting Orkney and Shetland. We are still waiting. When exactly can my constituents expect a fair deal on ferry fares? Paul Wheel Minister Paul Wheelers. Uh, well, clearly, Presiding Officer, this is a matter best directed to my colleague, the Minister for Transport in the Islands, uh, Hamza Yousaf, but pleased to try and respond as best I can today. Um, we do recognise the, the effect different uh, reduced fares options uh, do have on, on demand and the, and the case that's been made by local community uh, for, for help in terms of the uh, charges. It is worth say, saying that a consultation on fares was carried out at the end of 2016 and further analysis on the impacts on demand of different fares options and available options for increasing capacity is now being carried out. Cons I can assure the member consideration has been given to looking at how any subsidy could potentially be made available to commercial operators to allow them to provide reduced fares and there, this is, as I'm sure the member appreciates, a complex piece of work. Uh, it is an important issue to ensure that any fares mechanism is fair and legally compliant and I hope that helps answer the question. Question number four, Peter Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government, when it last met the Queensbury Crossing construction team? Cabinet Secretary. 
I last met with Michael Martin and David Climey of the Queensferry Crossing construction team on Friday the 19th of May when I visited the site to view the significant progress being made in the admittedly favourable weather conditions on that day. I was hugely impressed though by the progress that has been made across a number of the key activities on the project including roads on the north side nearing completion, the completion of removal of the tower cranes and trestles, and the installation of windshielding, waterproofing, and the first two layers of road surfacing across the Queen's Ferry Crossing. Peter Chapman. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. But given that the, the opening of the new bridge has already been postponed twice, and, we, and is now six months late, can the Minister give me an exact date as to when this bridge will open? And if not, why not? Cabinet Secretary. I think the member has heard uh, from uh, both the contractors uh, and the board of the company involved in overseeing the contract that the scheduled opening of the bridge will be in the window between mid-July and the end of August. And I know that the member is fully aware of why that was arranged rather than a specific date. That simply because of the weather conditions in the fourth. It's not six months past, of course its contract completion date, which is next month, um, which is worth bearing in mind. It's also worth saying, compared to other projects, say like the Runcorn Bridge, a fraction of the cost, a bigger bridge, and being delivered more quickly. So I'm very pleased about the progress that's been made in the bridge. I've also made it clear to the contractors that they should proceed according to what is necessary in terms of the safety of their employees. And I'm also very confident this is going to be uh, a world-leading bridge in a world heritage location that the whole of Scotland can be proud of. Claire Adamson. Presiding officer, does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that worker safety must be paramount importance in all projects and that those working on the bridge must follow the advice from experts regarding when it is unsafe to continue working? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Claire Adamson is right that safety of the workforce in all these projects is absolutely of paramount importance and FCBCs continue to assure us that they remain fully committed to completing the project safely. When I was uh, visiting the bridge on Friday, I managed to get to the top of one of the towers where you can see the level of activity taking place on the deck itself. And it's very important that activity, which involves a number of different work streams, is done in a way which ensures the safety of those involved. It also includes working to detailed method statements based on risk assessments prepared by experts, as Claire Adamson says, the people that we should listen to uh, in the construction field. Neil Findlay. In relation to a whole range of procurement issues uh, on that Force Bridge contract. What has the Cabinet Secretary learned from the process and what would he do differently next time? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, of course, procurement is dealt with by my colleague uh, Derek Mackay, but I'm aware, of course, from the time that I was involved in procurement, that the uh, regulations, the guidance that's been issued in terms of the European uh, context for procurement regulations has changed and it's produced some changes which, of course, we may want to take advantage of, but it's also worth saying if people like Neil Finlay have their way and we have a, a Brexit, then what we'll see is the absence of those uh, guidelines and absence of those standards, which I think could be damaging for these projects in future, and I would hope that wouldn't happen. Okay, thank you. We're going to move on to finance and constitution questions, and we'll start with question number one from Patrick Harvey. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether its 2017-18 public sector pay policy is subject to an equality impact assessment. Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay. Yes, uh, an equality impact assessment is undertaken as part of our consideration of public sector pay policy and the findings, the key findings from the assessment are reported in the policy. Patrick Harvey. Yes, uh, I'm, I'm grateful to the uh, Cabinet Secretary for the answer. I'm sure it was a uh, uh, merely a, an extraordinary coincidence uh, that the Equality Impact Assessment was in fact published the day after I submitted uh, this oral question. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that it's, it's such a fortunate coincidence though. Uh, in previous years under this public sector pay policy with inflation hovering at or, or indeed well below 1% it could be argued uh, that the government's approach uh, was ensuring that those at the, the bottom end uh, of the pay spectrum uh, particularly including women and uh, minority uh, groups such as disabled people and minority ethnic uh, groups were being protected. Now that inflation is increasing well beyond that and even the £400 minimum uplift to those below £22,000 income uh, are clearly getting a, at an uplift which is well below the, the current inflation rate, surely we need to look again at how people at the bottom end of the pay scales in the public sector can be protected with at least an inflation-based increase. 
Cabinet Secretary. I have some sympathies with the, the point that Patrick Harvey uh, has made, and I've certainly engaged in this subject uh, with the trade unions when I met them uh, very recently. And it's true to say that we have targeted support uh, to those uh, on lower earnings uh, within our pay control. And that's how specific measures such as that, fixed payment uh, and other uh, measures of support. And of course, we've got to get the balance right in sustaining the workforce as well as uh, proper remuneration. But I recognise that uh, inflation has been uh, an issue. But of course, we'd remind uh, the Chamber that we've got a policy on no compulsory redundancy as well, policy not shared by the uh, UK Government to try and ensure that we're sustaining uh, numbers and supporting a very valued workforce. James Kelly. Bearing in mind the fact that we now know that nurses, for example, are £3,400 cumulatively worse off as a result uh, of the, the pay cap, uh, does, the, do, does the Finance Secretary accept that that is unacceptable and will he take action to address it specifically when the autumn budget revision comes into play in September and there are underspends from other departments, will he use that opportunity to give those uh, suppressed, whose pay has been suppressed by this pay cap, a much needed uplift. Cabinet Secretary. I, I would make uh, uh, the point to James Kelly that we have, uh, through our budget process, uh, invested uh, hundreds of millions of pounds extra resources uh, into our public services. Uh, Labour didn't support uh, our budget. We were able to put in those uh, additional sums. But I've made the point I'm sympathetic to the workforce. Uh, the issues around uh, inflation, and we know how inflation is being affected because of the wider economic circumstances, partly caused by uh, uh, the uh, Brexit uh, decision as well and the, the, the pressures uh, there. But I've said I'll continue to engage uh, with the trade unions, uh, and I will, especially as we look at our pay policy uh, going forward in light of our financial constraints. But also, yes, I am acknowledging the pressures that are face as a consequence uh, of inflation. But I would remind the Chamber again that we've taken very specific measures uh, in Scotland, it's distinct to what the UK Government has done around pay, uh, pay that has uh, sustained uh, the workforce and ensured that there's policies in place such as targeting support to those on low pay and also no compulsory redundancies. Liam Kerr. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, on average in Scotland, women earn £60,000 less over their working life than men. So I just wonder what specific steps are the Scottish Government taking to ensure that the public sector pay policy will combat this? Cabinet Secretary. Well, it is surprising the criticism coming from the Tories on public sector pay policy, but we have avoided uh, compulsory uh, redundancies. We are looking at low pay measures. We recognise uh, the gender uh, impact here, and that's why we have targeted extra support towards low pay and support for the living wage, of course, as well, where the government was able to make uh, swift progress on this particular policy. But, of course, we'll look very closely at uh, gender impact and other impacts uh, as well in our pay policy, uh, which was uh, published in our consideration as part of the budget. Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that all employers, both public and private, should be doing everything they can to ensure they are providing equal opportunities for employees? And does he share my concern that the Labour Administration and Lord Lanarkshire, now propped up by the Tories, have yet to deal with their equal pay claims? Cabinet Secretary. Yes, I do share um, those uh, concerns, and I'm not quite sure that's what uh, the parties told the electorate that, that was their intentions before the council elections. Question number two, George Adam. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what impact the UK Government's austerity measures are having on the Scottish Government finances. Cabinet Secretary. By the end of the current spend review period, 2019-20, the Scottish Government's fiscal Dell block grant allocation will be £2.9 billion. That's 9.2% lower in real terms than it was in 2010-11. George Adam. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that Scotland has already suffered enough under the Westminster Government's austerity? And although the Scottish Government has mitigated where it can, many Scots families are still struggling because of Tory austerity. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, they are, and I'm sure that's uh, a debate uh, that will uh, continue over the course of the general election, where there are alternatives uh, to the Tories' plans. Dean Lockhart. Uh, thank you. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with the Fraser of Alder analysis showing that there has been 
no reduction in the discretionary spend of the Scottish Government in real terms since the SNP came to power in 2007. So any talk of Tory austerity is merely SNP spin. Cabinet Secretary. Dean Lockhart is not for the first time, I'm sorry to say, selectively quoting Fraser of Allender Institute. There has been real terms reductions and under the Tories there will be continued to be real terms reductions in our discretionary spend. And as Sarwar. Cabinet Secretary, I oppose both UK Government and Scottish Government austerity. So to, so to, quote, so to quote George Adams, and so to, they, do, they don't like the truth, do they, Presiding Officer? Uh, so to quote George Adams directly, to ask the Scottish Government what impact Scottish Government austerity measures are having on local government finances. Secretary. Uh, local, government, local government had a fair and strong settlement from Scottish Government. We've treated them fairly. We've consistently done that. And it is unfortunate that not only did uh, the Labour Party not support those extra resources to local government, including the £120 million attainment fund, where they're actually in power, they've frozen the council tax. So clearly the settlement is better than they said. Question number three, Neil Findlay. Meanwhile, back in the real world, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what action, what action it has taken to ensure that contractors working on hub projects are paid on time. Cabinet Secretary. Hey, as I have indicated in my reply last week to the member, the standard contract forms used for hub projects, including provision about the timely payment of contractors and subcontractors. Neil Findlay. Vaughan Engineering from my region has carried out extensive works for Gallifer Tri, one of the major contracts contractors involved in an SFT, in, in SFT hub projects. After completing work, Gallifer Tri unfairly held payment to the contractor for over two years and threatens to do so again, putting in jeopardy 500 jobs. I raised this last week with the Finance Secretary and he said he would look at individual cases. Will the Cabinet Secretary now agree to meet with me and representatives from Vaughan Engineering so we can try and resolve this very serious situation? Cabinet Secretary. Well, Mr Finlay, I do take this issue very seriously. Mr Finlay also said that there were a a number of cases that he was able to, to cite where this had been the case. So I absolutely will look at these matters if Mr Finlay will supply the details of the range of cases that is described to me. And I'll absolutely uh, take that forward. Question number four, Jackson Carlo. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what its current and developing position is on the introduction of a 50p rate of income tax. Cabinet Secretary. Analysis produced by the Scottish Government showed that there is a revenue risk associated with raising the additional rate. However, the First Minister has asked the Council of Economic Advisers to consider how and to what extent this risk can be mitigated, and if we are sufficiently assured that it can be, we will consider raising the additional rate from 45 pence to 50 pence from 2018-19 onwards. I, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for repeating to me what was in the SNP manifesto a year ago, but does he agree with the analysis recently conducted by the Fraser of Allender Institute by Graham Roy, the former SNP government advisor, who has concluded that as a result of the fiscal framework arrangements that were agreed, a 50p rate of tax applied across the whole of the United Kingdom would lead to a reduction in revenues to the Scottish Government? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I've set out exactly what the Scottish Government's uh, position is, the advice that we'll take, and that will be part of our consideration for the budget uh, going forward. We'll also engage uh, with other parties, but the First Minister has asked the Council of Economic Advisers to consider this matter, and that's exactly uh, the source of information that I'll drop on. Ivan McKee. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that in order to avoid the risk of any changes to the top rate of income tax reducing rather than increasing funds available for public services in Scotland. The Scottish Parliament needs to have powers over dividend and savings income tax, taxes impacted by incorporation, including capital gains and corporation tax, and, crucially, powers to police tax avoidance. Cabinet Secretary. The presiding officer, I, I know you want shorter answers to get through as many questions as possible, so in essence, yes, I do agree with that point. Jackie Bailey. On the basis that the First Minister has changed her mind about eight times now about the 50 pence tax rate, isn't it the case, Cabinet Secretary, that she tells everybody else what to do, but when she has the power herself, she runs a million miles in the opposite direction? Cabinet Secretary. I, 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 I'm absolutely of the view that we set, set out a consistent position uh, on this. We said how we'll draw upon evidence to make those decisions. But I think it's abundantly clear it's the Labour Party that don't know what they're doing in tax, other than taxing some of the most vulnerable in our society, including a basic rate uh, increase as well. Question number five, Graham D. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how many small businesses in Angus have received support from the Small Business Bonus Scheme. 
Cabinet Secretary. It is estimated that the Small Business Bonus Scheme supported around 2,500 properties in Angus in 2016-17. Uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I have a constituent running a now highly successful high street business who tells me that the small business bonus was the difference between surviving and failing in the early years of getting that business up and running. Can I ask, has the Scottish Government done any analysis of the economic benefit the small business bonus delivers in Angus and across wider Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the Scottish Government is engaged with stakeholders uh, and businesses uh, direct. Uh, the FSB, for example, have recently surveyed I'm, a, I'm a, about 1,000 business owners, and the results found that about a fifth of small firms reported that they would close the business if the scheme were to be abolished, and similar proportions said they would have to cancel investments or amend their plans for growth if that was the case. Question number six, Ruth McGuire. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what action it took to ensure that the local government elections were open to candidates from all parts of society. Minister Joe Fitzpatrick. A wide range of people are eligible to stand for election in Scottish local government elections, and the Scottish Government would like to see that diversity reflected in the profile of those who stand as candidates and are elected to public office. One group who are underrepresented in all elections are disabled people. Whilst the selection of party candidates is a matter for political parties, we have provided support for disabled candidates through the Access to Elected Fund Office, office Fund, um, which was put in place to meet candidates' additional disability-related costs. Of the 39 candidates who received support through the fund, 15 were elected in 12 local authorities. Ruth McGuire. Thank you. Thank the Minister for that answer. Given the success of the Access to Elected Office Fund at um, our most recent local government elections, does the Minister agree with me that this financial help has clearly opened up the electoral process to people who previously may not have been able to take part? And would he join me in calling on the UK Government to reopen the equivalent UK fund? Yes. I, I very much do. I, I, I think um, what we've shown is that this, this, fu this um, fund has been very successful in, in enabling people who might otherwise have found it very difficult to access elected office here in Scotland. And I would encourage the UK government to look at how, how the, the model has worked in this case, perhaps to get in touch with Inclusion Scotland, who administered the scheme here in Scotland, and hopefully to spread it out um, ac across the UK. Question number seven, Ross Greer. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment it's made of the distributional impact on Scottish households of its proposed air departure tax reduction. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government fully supports and recognises the importance of robust analysis of its policies. That's why the Scottish Government has committed to undertaking and publishing a range of impact assessments of air departure tax. This includes an independent economic assessment which will consider the best way to design a robust monitoring and evaluation framework so that this can be put in place for assessing, amongst other things, the social economic impacts of ADT in the future. The economic assessment will be published in the autumn, no later when the government sets out its secondary legislation plans for ADT tax bans and tax rate amounts. Ross Greer. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. He'll be delighted to know the Scottish Greens have already done some of this work for him. Research that we commissioned has shown that the richest 10% of households stand to benefit four times as much as the poorest 10%. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that that is not the action of a progressive government? Yeah, yeah. Cabinet Secretary. Well, we've been uh, progressive as a government in relation to currently devolved taxes such as LBTT and how we've approached uh, uh, other taxes such as our council tax position. But in relation to UK APD, it is the highest tax of its kind in Europe and one of the highest in the world. And we do want to improve Scotland's uh, competitive uh, position and our connectivity and business growth. But, of course, all of that will be part of the wider consideration, and I'll refer back to the assessments that we have uh, commissioned. Marie Todd. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what work is ongoing for the legislation of exemption to ADT for the Highlands and Islands? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I know I've been asked about this at uh, committee uh, as well, and I could advise the member that we are pursuing uh, the position with the UK Government. As the Member State, it's for the UK Government to approach the, the EU uh, through that uh, notification process. And we're working in partnership for the, with the UK Government to try and ensure that we can continue that Highlands and Islands uh, exemption. That's certainly the policy intent of this Government. Question number eight, Claire Hockey. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what additional revenue will be raised in 2017-18 by councils who have increased council tax rates. Cabinet Secretary. The additional council tax revenue in 2017-18 will be £53 million. Claire Hockey. 
Uh, I thank the, the Minister for that answer. Uh, my own local council, which until recently, uh, 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 the recent local authority elections, was a Labour-led council, chose not to raise council tax, despite years of asking Scottish Government to lift the council tax freeze. How much money would a council tax rise have provided for local public services to spend? Cabinet Secretary. I can advise a member in the chamber that by freezing the council tax in 2017-18, South Lanarkshire Council decided to forego £4.2 million, reducing their overall potential increase in support for local services, whilst of course the matter for local government and that local authority is in sharp contrast to what was said uh, by Labour uh, before. Graeme Simpson. Thank you. Um, would, would the Cabinet Secretary not uh, uh, agree with me that Claire Hawhey uh, was entirely wrong to, uh, on, on South Lanarkshire Council? It was the policy of South Lanarkshire Council not to increase council tax rates, and they stuck to that. Um, that was their right to do so. Um, so would he agree, uh, A, on that factual point, and B, that it's not a matter for the Scottish Government to give a view on... Uh, whether council should increase uh, council tax rates. I, I, I'm not sure that Graham Simpson was listening no. to my answer before he asked his question. I made the point it is a matter for local government. It is a matter for South Lanarkshire Council. But I was simply pointing out that the Labour Party for years had said that the council tax freeze was unsustainable and with the position to increase it, they froze the council tax. I'm pointing out the absurdity of the position uh, of uh, the Labour Party in that particular council and for completeness there were many other Labour authorities as well who chose to freeze the council tax which I think helps make the point that the local government settlement was fair because it put councils in a position where they felt they could do this. And question number nine, Murdo Fraser. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government when it expects the Barclay Review of non-domestic rates to publish its recommendations. Cabinet Secretary. The Barclay Review of business rates will report to ministers this summer. Murder Fraser. I'm going to thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response and we look forward to seeing uh, that report. But given that the, this Parliament's Local Government Committee uh, asked the, uh, the Scottish Government to, to ask the Barclay Review to reopen the period for consultations so more evidence could be heard from businesses affected by the recent rates revaluation, given that the Scottish Government refused to accede to that request, what assurance can we have that the Barclay Review will properly consider all the issues that arise uh, from the recent revaluation and the impact that's had on businesses? Well, I have to say the Conservative position on this was to say act before the review first of all, it then hurry the review, rush the review and now the position is to prolong the review. I accept though that the Barclay review is, is of great importance as we look at non-domestic rates. I do look forward to its findings. We will act swiftly uh, on uh, those findings but in relation to the point around the local government committee, um, I think it's encouraged the, the Barclay Review to, to look again at the consultation and, and those who they've engaged with, and I believe that they have done that. And of course, it will be for government and parliament to consider those matters uh, that are presented to us from Barclay Review and matters wider uh, than that. But I think that uh, Ken Barclay, in engaging with them, has reflected on those comments and been able to reach out to, to others to ensure that the consultation and the engagement is as comprehensive as possible in light of the comments made at that committee. Thank you. That concludes our question session. We'll take a few moments to move on to the next item of business. In the meantime, can I also congratulate Mr Mackay and Mr Fitzpatrick, and without the risk of embarrassing them further, on getting through nine questions and nine supplementaries. And uh, I would just encourage all ministerial colleagues to take a leaf out of the minister's book. <laughs>